continuing, of course, the Gospel of Mark, and if you've been tracking with us, I trust that God's Word has been washing over you, that you've been thinking about God's Word, especially this Gospel written by Mark. Uh, Mark was uh, not one of the disciples of Jesus. Uh, rather, he probably would have been a little bit younger at that stage. Uh, most likely, Jesus had visited his house with the disciples. G uh, Mark was related to, uh, to Barnabas. Um, he was discipled by Peter, the apostle, and then writes this account that after the death and the resurrection of Christ, he writes this account really with the purpose of driving home who Jesus is and what he did. So take out your weekly guide. This will help you to follow along with today's message. I'll actually be teaching from these notes, and then you're also going to need a, a Bible on your lap today. We begin the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Mark today. If you didn't bring a Bible, um, there's a chair Bible under every other chair, page 842, we'll turn you to Mark 7. Or if you have a mobile device, just go to viachurch.org slash guide. These notes, all of the scriptures will come up there for you, and uh, that's a great way to be able to engage. And also viachurch.org uh, slash give is a great way to be able to give at any time throughout the week to Via Church. So we're going to be looking at the first 23 verses of uh, that's the seventh chapter of, uh, of Mark, and uh, this is an incredible interaction um, with Pharisees and scribes um, from that were uh, Jewish leaders, and they have an interaction with Jesus, and uh, we're going to read about that today and some of Jesus' teaching in this and apply it to our lives today. How many of you believe God's word still applies to our lives today? And God has spoken, and this is the authoritative rule of conduct and faith, but God is still speaking today through the power of his spirit in accordance with his word, and we're going to let God speak to us. So let's stand for the reading of God's word. As you follow along, we usually use uh, ESV, English Standard Version, here at Via Church. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy, prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, the people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that is going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. May God bless the reading of his word. 
Father, we thank you that your word is profitable. May your word today profit our souls and cause us to understand your character, the redemptive narrative of the gospel, the work of Christ, the ways of your spirit, and what you've called your church to do. Speak to us now, God. Cause us, Lord, to worship you in word and in deed. God, examine our hearts today. May the meditations of our hearts, the words of our mouths, be pleasing in your sight and in your hearing, O oh God, as we humble ourselves before your authoritative word. And everyone said, amen, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I want you to do something uh, as we begin. I'm going to make you talk to your neighbor, and uh, I'm not going to make you say you look fantastic because sometimes you guys whine to me about that, so I won't make you compliment your neighbor at all today. But I'm going to, I'm going to uh, gonna ask you to just, uh, with people around you a little bit, I want you to just uh, uh, say what words come to your mind when I say the word legalism. Legalism. What words come to your mind when I say the word legalism? So go ahead, make a little noise in here. Just talk to the people next to you a little bit. You might have to turn around or move a little bo- bit. All right, that's great. It's so fun to watch because you guys, all your personalities sort of come out. A couple of you are like, and you're done, you know, like, and a few of you are like, oh, this is so good. It's a great discussion. Let's go out to eat and finish this discussion. It's awesome. And so I love watching the different personalities in the room. But, but yeah, so you might have thought of a few things um, that come to your mind. Maybe, uh, maybe you thought of something uh, when you were growing up, or maybe you thought about some rules. Maybe you thought about a person. Uh, hopefully you were uh, sort of kind when you said that. Um, Legalism. Today we're going to talk about the deadly lures of legalism. I, th- I love that word lures. I think about sort of a lure on a fishing line that sort of causes you to chase after that. And there are some things um, that cause us in our human nature to sort of chase after um, legalistic thinking. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Your thoughts about legalism probably uh, are derived from your experiences, uh, maybe moments uh, that you were in a place that seemed very legalistic, or maybe some people you knew that were very legalistic, um, or maybe somebody's called you legalistic. There might have been lots of different kinds of things that came to your mind. As we look at the Gospel of Mark, Mark is concerned with readers knowing who Jesus is and what he did. He is driving home the point that Jesus was no ordinary man. Uh, Jesus is 100% God. When he was here on earth and took on human flesh, born of a virgin and dwelt among us, While he was here on earth, he was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. That is basic Orthodox Christianity and theology. He is eternally existent. That means that Jesus does not have a beginning. He was there uh, uh, with God, eternally existent. He was there at the foundation of the earth and of the world. He has no beginning and he will have no end. Jesus willingly left the splendor of heaven, left the glory of his Father, and took on human flesh, becoming God incarnate. Jesus becomes this suffering servant, and he gives his life as a ransom for many. In fact, Mark chapter 10, verse 45, we haven't gotten there yet in our teaching, but uh, it quotes Jesus' own words in Mark chapter 10, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you've ever watched a, a, uh, perhaps a movie, you know what a ransom is, a ransom note, sort of saying, hey, I'll give this to be able to free them. And so Jesus gave his life as a ransom to free us from the bondage of sin. Jesus, a Jewish rabbi, did not fit the mold of the Jewish leaders. 
That would be the Pharisees that they're talking about today or the scribes. Also, the Sadducees are mentioned in other places in the gospel. If you are familiar with the four gospel accounts of the life of Jesus, you've sort of learned to cringe at these religious people. Anytime we say Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, we all go, ooh, ooh. All right. And so I, we almost we almost like cheer. Boo. Like we don't. Boo, we don't like the Pharisees. You know, Jesus. Yay. But I'll just tell you during Jesus's time, the Pharisees, the Sadducees and the scribes were not scorned as legalists. They were not considered to be bad guys. They were looked up to. They were model citizens. They were people of piety and religion. They were well-educated. Oftentimes, they tended to be on the wealthy side. They were the, they were the perfect example. Today, if we could say it, we would say, oh, let's describe like, what they would be like, and let's put them into our modern church context. These are people that would come every single week. These are people that would give very generously. These would be people that would they roll up their sleeves and, and serve. They, these are people that would be like model church people. And so this is, this is the way these folks are viewed as Jesus comes on the scene. So, you know, we have sort of this history of four gospels. Every time we hear Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, it has this connotation and we, we sort of boo at them. But this is a really incredible moment because these, this would be like... This would be like Jesus saying these things to the people that we would say model perfectly for us what it means to follow God. And yet he's having these interactions. According to Paul, though, uh, in Romans chapter 10, later on he talks about those Jewish leaders in Romans 10 uh, verses 2 through 4. It says this, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of righteousness, the righteousness of God, and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. What Paul is saying here is saying um, they didn't think about the righteousness and purity of God. Instead, they wanted to establish their own righteousness and purity. They didn't submit to God's holiness. Instead, they established their own laws of holiness. They were more concerned with the exact practices of the law, both God's and the ones that they had created, than they were about the spirit or the heart of the law. The word legalist even goes outside of Christianity. So there are times in, in government or in law that legalists are the ones that are going to the finite, uh, 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 the minutia of a law, but ignoring the spirit of the law. So the definition of legalism is this. It's right there in your notes. Strict adherence to the law, especially the stressing of the letter of the law, rather than its spirit. Today, we can sort of develop this passion for God and the things of God and yet never know him just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We can be deceived, we can be captured, we can be enslaved by this deadly lure of legalism. Our pride in our religious rituals, our pride in church practices and in cultural traditions, our pride in good deeds, or our pride in our moral lifestyles can blind us to both our great sinfulness, but it can also blind us to the great Savior, Jesus, who alone can rescue us from our sins. So although Jesus was this Jewish rabbi, he was challenging and condemning the status quo, and the religious leaders weren't too happy. Jesus exposes the religious leaders' pride. He exposes their impure motives. He exposes their incongruent behavior. He exposes their, their bondage and their corrupt hearts. His words to them are always very harsh. So today's text sort of gives us this very clear picture of the ugliness of legalism. First of all, they're guilty of false worship. 
Some of the Pharisees and scribes in verse 1, they come, these teachers of the law come to Jesus. His popularity is growing. You can see that in verse 1. They've determined who Jesus is already. Remember, Mark is trying to establish that. But the scribes and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, had already determined who he was. They had decided that he was blasphemous, and they are determined to take him down. These guys are proficient in reciting prayers. These guys can recite the Torah or the law or some of the Old Testament, as we would call it. They're great at debate. But unfortunately, like all religious legalists, they're honoring God with their lips, which results in false worship. These spiritual elite have surrounded Jesus, and they're there not to say, hey, we want to learn from him. They're looking for him to do something so they can denounce him and that they can bring down his credibility. It's a great lesson for us here. And a lesson for us is not to compare ourselves with others. I think we're all, if we really have to be honest, are really good at comparing ourselves to others. I mean, we're good at it. I mean, I, sometimes I'm feeling bad about myself. I've watched hoarders on television and I just feel so much better about anything messy in my life. I'm like, well, I'm not as bad as that. I feel very healthy today. I watched hoarders, you know. The disciples give them the exact opportunity that they're looking for. Remember, they're trying to figure something out about him and denounce him and point out his wrong. They eat with defiled or ceremonially unclean, unwashed hands. That ceremonially unclean means the opposite of devoted to God. So look at verse 2. They saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. This has nothing to do with hygiene. This has nothing to do with my frustration of watching guys use a restroom and walk out without washing their hands because I always want to like yell all the way through the restaurant and chase and say, he has not washed his hands. I've never done that yet, but it's in my head and I have to suppress that, okay? Like sometimes I've watched all the way across the restaurant watching a guy eat after he, I watched him. He didn't wash his hands. It just bothers me. So this has nothing to do with hygiene, okay? This has nothing to do with hygiene. This was a religious tradition that went beyond scriptural command. Remember, this is traditions of the elders. It even says that in our text. This practice was used to establish the spiritual superiority of the Pharisees and scribes over the common person. Marx gives some, some explanation in verses 3 through 4. You can read that. The, their rituals and traditions had taken over their lives and had enslaved them. This religious washing had good intent. How many of you know lots of traditions or things that we feel strongly about have good intent? The good intention was to remind Jews that they were unclean before God. But they had sort of changed it. They had begun to sort of twist it. And the main, what, main thing was that they were off base on the source of their impurity. They felt that they would wash their hands in case they had touched a Gentile, a non-Jew. They were washing their hands in case they touched something that a Gentile had also touched. The problem wasn't on the outside with their hands, but the problem was on the inside. It wasn't their hands, it was their hearts. How many of you know it's difficult to compare hearts? Because only God, man looks at the outward, but only God looks at the heart. So only God can see the heart. So, so, so these things happen and they can't compare hearts. So instead they, do, they decide to draw up a list of external religious activities to see who comes out on top, to see who can win this thing. Who can get it the most right? And so they've created these traditions because it's a lot easier to draw up external religious activities than to really stay humble before God, which doesn't really feed the human pride. So this holiness is starting, they try to protect holiness and purity by a list of rules, but holiness is not protected with a fence of rules. This is why they can't understand Jesus. He doesn't have this fence of rules like that, but he's holy. 
We really have to be careful to avoid being a hypocrite with a distant heart. One thing that Jesus constantly did was call out hypocrites and expose them for who they truly were. Look at verse 6. He says, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. Basically, to paraphrase it, he says, Israel, he's basically saying, Isaiah hit a bullseye when he prophesied about you hypocrites. He's saying, he did it so well. He, he hit the nail on the head. He hit a bullseye. Isaiah did a long time ago when he described you. Jesus does not even, notice in this text, he never, he never even addresses the conduct of his disciples. Instead, he exposes the heart of the matter. He quotes Isaiah 29, 13. He says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That's just a credible thought. Honoring God with your lips and your mouth, but your heart being far and distant from God. He says, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. He's saying, in vain they worship me. It's a false worship. It's a worship, but it's with their lips. It's not with their heart. Their heart's far from me. Their heart really isn't following God, but with their lips they're doing this. And then they begin to teach the, the, the commandments of men, traditions as doctrine. They're saying, this is right up there with what God said is what we have said and what we have established in our tradition. Today, making lists of what we think must happen and must not happen in worship is sort of common to us. So I'm going to sort of bring this home. I'm going to bring it to sort of where we live today. Sometimes our personal preferences in a music worship style or our preferences in dress or our preferences in sermon delivery style, our preferences in how a church addresses moral issues can become sacred checklists for us. I wrestle with this. I wrestle with this. Our teaching team wrestles with it. Uh, I'll just sort of bring something down that's just happening to us right here in our church. Create a little tension for us, okay? So uh, I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, we're very excited that a while back, uh, the company NEC donated an $18,000 projector for us for free. How many of you said, that's a cool thing. We could use that. And so we, uh, we began to sort of move forward, trying not to spend much money to get this, to get this working. And uh, we had had a temporary setup since Christmas last year. We had a scrim across the back. We put up some banners. Um, we had a cross that we hung there. And as this all sort of came together in the week that it was coming down, the teaching team came in and we sort of were looking at it and going, where will the cross go? And we did. We sat right where you were. We were standing there and we we're saying what, you know, that it doesn't fit. Proportionally, it doesn't fit. We need, we want to have a cross but what are we going to do until we can get the right cross? And so this, I'll tell you, I grew up in a, I grew up in a United Methodist church, and uh, there were lots of artifacts in worship around. There were, there were stained glass windows that I still, I can still, I can still actually probably draw them and tell you where some of the stories of the Bible were in the stained glass. And I used to love as a kid to be able to sit and look at those things. And so we were here, and we were talking about the cross, which uh, we are having a cross made up. A prototype has been made and then someone in our congregation is going to help actually craft a cross. And, and we talked about where it was going to go. So we said we can do this, but we don't, have, we don't have it figured out right now. What are we going to do? So what do we do with the cross that we had hanging from a fishing line? And so we were like, well, you know, we can't hang it right in front of the screen. That'll look a little weird. And if we put the cross off center, will that communicate something that we feel about the cross that we don't feel about the cross? Um, you know, do we just sort of lean it up against the wall in the corner? That doesn't look like it's really good. How many of you know that that would be a hard conversation? So we're, we're talking about it because it's important to us. Okay, and we and we were saying we really want this cross. We 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 don't have an auditorium. We have an auditorium that has basketball hoops, and so we don't we don't have a lot of religious artifacts around. And and after the cross was down, and we knew we wanted to put one up, we said this: you could be anywhere. You don't know that you're at a church, and we want the cross up. And so we're working at it. And so then we had a discussion: should we announce that we are making a cross so that people don't think that we're against the cross? 
Because sometimes in churches, conspiracy theories really fly around. They travel sometimes faster than good reports. And so he says, should we make an announcement and draw attention to the fact that we know that the cross is down, but there's a cross coming? Should we make an announcement and, and maybe let people know? And then, and then we, we were, so we said, well, we didn't know if we should. And so we sort of made an announcement to one service. We didn't make an announcement to another. And people are asking questions. And our standard answer is we're making a cross. We're putting a cross up, and we're excited about it, and, uh, and, and we're we're, we're working at it. I actually have pictures on my phone that were texted to me of sort of the prototype and they're trying to make the cross. We, we want it in a prominent place and we want it to, to fit. So we have a couple of weeks right now as a church having service without a cross. I'll tell you, it bothers me a little bit. I walk in and I go, ah, where's the cross? And so I started thinking, I've been thinking a lot about it over the last few weeks and maybe you've thought about it. Maybe you've had some conversations about it because I know there's been some conversations about it. And so as we were, as I was thinking about it, I was thinking about, you know, this. There's the scripture, the commands of God, and there's traditions of man. And where did the cross come from in, in our history, in the Christian history? Is there a Bible verse that says you must worship with a cross? There isn't a Bible verse that you must worship with a cross. And if you study the history of the cross, the first couple of hundred years, the church did not identify with the cross. They didn't worship with a cross. There was some rejection in the early church for, for a couple hundred years as the church started. They were saying that's a horrible picture of an execution item. Today it would be like putting an electrical chair. It's an ugly picture. It was a horrible picture. That's not what they wanted to remember of their Lord who is risen. And so it was a couple hundred, then you start, you start reading the history of it all, and it was a couple of hundred years. It's really not fully established until the 300s that they started to identify the cross as a Christian symbol, and it became very sacred. Today, the cross means a lot to us. It shows one of the greatest acts of love ever given, that God would so love the world that he'd send his only begotten son to die that he suffered there for us. It's become very important to us. It's important to me. And so I've been, as I'm preparing this whole week and laying out a thing about legalism and thinking about, you know, traditions that we hold on to that aren't in Scripture, taking something above Scripture, I had to really wrestle with this. I love the cross and a cross is coming. Okay? But we have to look at some of the things that tie our hearts, don't we? We have to look at them and we have to say, I have, I have an affinity for that. I have a love for that. I care for that. Even though scripture doesn't command that, it becomes very precious and sacred to us. So before we sort of scorn the Pharisees and boo them out of the story, they had things that were very precious to them. Things that were very sacred to them. Traditions of elders over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Sometimes taking what had been commanded, but then twisting it or changing it, and sometimes changing it for their own benefit. So I just had to bring something that sort of made us all feel a little uncomfortable. The, the, the worry about this is that I'd have this conversation, you'd walk away saying, he doesn't think we need a cross. We need a cross. We love a cross. <laughs> but it's a tension for us, isn't it? An artifact, a symbol in worship that's very precious to us today that there's no scriptural mandate about and wasn't a practice of the early church. And so sometimes when we sort of make these lists of all of the things that have to happen, our preferences, sometimes if all of the right boxes are checked, we're good. But if the lists, uh, lists are very easy for us to check off, it's easier for us to check off a list than it is to examine our hearts. Our hearts can be very far from God while all of the boxes are checked off. So we sort of look at, at, at some of those things. When we think about those traditions, we think about things that are very sacred to us. Let's think a little bit about, even let's go back to the cross illustration for a moment. I hate to keep drawing you back to that, but go back to the cross illustration for a moment. There, there are some very heated and passionate conversations. We've had them on our teaching team. 
And so how can we worship for a few weeks out the cross? There's been some very passionate conversations in our, in our, in our congregation, and some of you have been in those. And then I sort of think about what's happening in this story. Jesus has just fed 15 to 20,000 people. He's healing the sick. I mean, he is teaching just powerfully about what the kingdom of God is like. All of these incredible things are happening, and yet the, the Pharisees and the scribes' passion, their conversation, what they choose to talk about at that moment was a tradition, and their passion flowed to a tradition more than the work of Jesus. And when I think about the passion that some of us have had, and me included, about the cross in our place of worship, there's, I've had a little bit more passion about this conversation than sometimes I've had about the 18,000 orphans in Arizona or the homeless in Mesa or Albanian gypsies or refugees by the hundreds of thousands seeking refuge in Europe. It's easy for us, before we look down our nose at the Pharisees, it's easy for us to have more passion about our traditions than the very heart of God and compassion for people. Our hearts can be far from God while all of the boxes are checked off. And it causes us to really ask the question, are we text-driven or are we tradition-driven? Look at verses 8 through 9. Jesus says, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. See, when we become legalistic, we can blindly fall into spiritual disobedience. We have to make sure that we don't reject God's command and establish our own. Not all traditions are bad. Traditions really hold together a society. They become bad when we put them on the same level as Scripture or in place of Scripture. It's when we begin to say it's the Bible plus the few things that are very sacred to me. It's, the, it's Jesus plus some other things that have to be checked off in my mind to say that it's a good thing. It's that approach to Christianity that can cause us to have fallen into spiritual disobedience. Adding requirements to the Bible nullifies its truth and power in your life. This is really the crux of it. Look at verse 13. Jesus said, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. I mean, we have to be very cautious that we, we can dismiss the Pharisees as, as uh, having silly fixations on matters of no consequence, but they were a great consequence to them, just like we have matters today that feel very, very important to us. Here's the fact, the really hard fact. We know it's possible to be a hypocrite. We see it so clearly in others. But when hypocrisy is ever in us, we tend to go spiritually deaf, dumb, and blind. Most of the time, when we, maybe when we talked about legalism, you were thinking about somebody or a group of people. We usually, when we talk about hypocrisy, we think about someone else. We would never say, oh no, we have some hypocrisy. We have some, some rules that we hold dear that we rise above scripture and will grow very passionate about. We don't usually look at ourselves like that. And we have to recognize our own religiosity. Traditions aren't bad. But our heart is what God is after. This is what I believe Jesus meant when he told the parable about calling out a speck in your brother's eye when there's like a, oh, sorry, that was weird. When, there, when there's like a plank in your own eye. 
He gives us absurdity, like a two by four coming out of your own eye. And you're like, hey, I think there's something in your eye, just a little speck right there. And this is what Jesus is sort of talking about. We need to make sure that we don't manipulate God's word to our own advantage. These religious leaders had positioned their traditions in the place of Scripture, and they had positioned themselves in the place of God. They're standing before Jesus going, how is it that you do not follow what needs to be followed? What this really tells us is that our hearts are truly idol factories. I was watching, I love, uh, there's a television show that sort of talks about like how things are made. I love this show. It's just like this little documentary. They just, how something is made. And and one of them was, I loved it. It was those yellow peeps, right? Those little marshmallow little chicks, you know? And it took you to the peep factory, man. It is so cool to see how the peeps are coming out, man. And you just see these yellow peeps, just zillions of them. And they give the statistics of how many yellow peeps are eaten all year long. I thought it was only like Easter, but they eat them all year long. And then they've got, they've got different color peeps. They've got Christmas peeps. Who knew? And they've got all these. Kind of, and so they, and, but it was just watching. And it's just an amazing thing. They back up to this massive factory and the peeps are like, just coming out. I'm like, that's a lot of peeps. But our hearts have this propensity to crank out idols that we trust in, that we say, if we do these things, live this way, think this way, do these things, if these things exist where I am, then I am right with God and my righteousness is good. And we have this way of cranking out these idols. We crank out religious traditions we may just be just as guilty as the Pharisees of Jesus' day and not even see it. See, legalists lack true understanding. What's really at the crux of this is these uncleaned hands, the defilement. Defilement, what Jesus is saying, has its root on the inside. Every human heart has the root of every human sin in it. This is the brokenness of our world. This is the shatteredness of our world. We, we look at some of the most gruesome, heinous sin in the world, and if we are honest before God, we have to say, the root of that is in my own soul. It's entirely possible to look nice on the outside while being dead on the inside. The most, what Jesus is driving home here is that the most deadly contamination is not what I happen to touch with my hands. The most deadly contamination is what is in my heart. And in verses 14 through 20, you can sort of look at it. Jesus teaches, and then he reteaches it to his disciples because they said, we don't quite get it. One of the most critically important spiritual lessons in the whole word of God. And his point is that corruption is not external, but internal. Look what it says. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. It's not what goes in, but it's what naturally comes out. That is the source of our defilement. This is echoed later by James, the half-brother of Jesus. In James chapter 1, during the early church, he wrote and he said, but each person is tempted when when he is lured and enticed by his own desire." Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Even today, I don't really like to admit that the source of defilement in my life comes from here. 
I'd like to say it was the things I've been accidentally exposed to or things that from the outside, the threats of my defilements come from this evil world all out there. It's not really from in here. That is a harder thing for all of us to say. Defilement starts at the inside, but it reveals its fruit on the outside. Verses 21 through 23 gives us a massive understanding of our sin and our brokenness straight from the mouth of Jesus. Look what it says. For from within, everyone say within. From within, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, pride, foolishness. Every time there's a list like this, I'm like, stop! Stop! Please stop! I don't even like saying those words. I don't want to think about those words. And Jesus says, all these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, go ahead, wash your hands all you want. You won't fix your heart. Jesus didn't come to say, hey, I've come to give you a better way to wash your hands. I haven't come to try to teach you how to scrub up before surgery. It's not about that. And it's not about you saying, my hands are cleaner than your hands. You want to see? It is about understanding. When you start to say all of these things come from within, when we say every human sin has its root in every human heart, it's an ugly thing to look because we know some monsters in this world and that are modern time monsters, some of them now dead. And we see that and we go, no, 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 that's not in me. And Jesus is trying to get is get people to understand that all of that is in us. It comes out of us naturally. That is the brokenness of who we are. And it's based upon pride. You can go back to Genesis 3 and read it for yourself. It's based upon pride. It's putting ourselves in God's place. It's, it's saying what I do is my choice. And that is in us all. And that, my friend, isn't something you can scrub away. It isn't something, I mean, I, when I hear that, I just want to just swallow some antibacteria stuff and see if it gets to the heart of things. But you can't cleanse that. And that's the exact thing that Jesus said, that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a man to be saved because he can't do it on his own. Only Jesus, my friend, can cleanse a heart. Our hearts are corrupt. Sin's root in, roots in our hearts will produce sin's fruit. The fruits that we naturally produce as fallen people are destructive. Read that list, and all of us have experienced the destruction of those things in our lives. These evil actions flow naturally from our sinful hearts, the source of sin. My friend, the problem in the world isn't out there somewhere. The problem in the world is inside of us. Legislation won't fix it. Going back to old church practices from 30 years ago won't fix it. The answer to the problem inside of us isn't doing more. The answer to the problem inside of us is what Christ has done. It is done. Christ's holiness never suffers contamination. That's the awe and wonder that Mark is driving home to Jesus. Even with Jesus taking on human form, his holiness never suffered contamination. He gives us this perfect example of living in this world, but totally holy and devoted to God. And you realize his holiness is never contaminated, but his holiness, my friend, will transform everything it touches. 
And when you allow the holiness and the righteousness of Jesus to penetrate your heart, it will absolutely transform your heart. We cannot be a people trusting in our right beliefs and our right practices and our right behaviors. We must be humble sinners trusting only in what Jesus has done. It has been done. It doesn't still have to be done. It has been done in Christ. And religion would say, no, there's much more that you have to do to measure up. But my friend, the Christian message is it has been done in Jesus Christ. It has been finished. It has been accomplished. You simply, my friend, need by faith to humble yourself before God. God and receive his righteousness into your life. You will never stand before God and God says, oh, look at those good things. Oh, those are pretty good. Oh, the meter went down a little bit there, but then it came up here. No, my friend, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is applied to us through faith and through grace. And when he looks at your life, my friend, he doesn't see your sin and he doesn't see even your good deeds. Instead, he sees the righteousness of Jesus applied to your life. It has been done. It was done 2,000 years ago. And the message that the church of Jesus proclaims, not from platforms like this, but in our everyday life, in our neighborhoods and in our workplaces and in our schools, the message we proclaim is that it has been done in Christ. It is completed in Christ. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes refused to see that they needed a savior. They trusted in their practices. They trusted in their own doings. But my friend, Jesus was absolutely going to the heart of it saying, you cannot do enough to fix the defilement of your heart. My friend, we need to fully trust the work of Christ applied to our lives through faith. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? So, Father, before I lead prayers in this room and lead people in response, I just come to you and confess, God, my own, my own trust sometimes in my own life, my own good deeds. Times, God, that I've trusted practices that bring comfort to me that aren't commanded in your word but might be good practices. I confess to you that there's times I can go through the motions and look right on the outside, and yet my heart is prone to wander. And God, once again, by the truth of Mark's words, I recognize that the root of every human sin is in my heart. There's a hopelessness about that. Until, Father, I look at your son, Jesus Christ, and see great hope. Because his holiness was never contaminated, but instead, in perfect example, poured out for me on the cross. And Lord, I once again receive grace and the forgiveness and the righteousness of Jesus applied to my life. For my righteousness, oh God, before you is nothing but just dirty rags. Cleanse my heart, oh God. Today, if you're here You never come to the point where you just say, I can't, there's no way I can clean up my own heart. I need the righteousness of Jesus applied to my heart and my life. And you're there and you say, I need to receive that. Maybe for the first time or the first time in a long time. If that's you right now. I'm going to ask you to do something I wasn't planning on doing. I'm just going to ask you right now. If you're there and you say, I need to receive the righteousness of Christ. I'm going to ask you to make your way from where you're sitting 
to just kneel up at these steps just as a sign from God. You say, I can do my business with God right here at my chair. Yes, you can. There's sometimes a physical action that's needed to sort of signify what's happening in our hearts. And if right now you're just saying, I need to come to God. I need to receive this grace. I need to receive this righteousness of Christ. I need my heart cleansed by Jesus and what he has done. Right now, just make your way and kneel up here and there'll be some folks that'll be happy to pray with you so you won't be alone, but just walk forward if you would. If you wanna do that right now and just confess your heart to God, just make your way right now and come to these steps. And you can do that at any time between now and the time we end this service. Christ followers in this room. This message hits the very heart those of us that were touched by God and, and yet then begin to create things that maybe at some point are very meaningful, but we begin to trust those things as idols. And if God's dealing with you on something right now, do your business with God and confess it. Maybe anything you've put above a scriptural command or a scriptural practice, and you've said, this is more important to me, it's so important, this gets done, it has to be this way. And you've just become very adamant that it has to be a certain way. Confess that to God and say, God, free me from legalism, free me from man's traditions, free me from my own love of my, my own traditions. Free me from that. God, hear our prayers. Cleanse our hearts. Make us clean. Make us clean. Just keep giving your heart to God for a moment. I just don't think we're done. We're just not done for a moment. There's some prayers that need to be said. There's some prayers that are being said right now. Just do your business with God for a moment. mercy on us, O oh God. Set us free, O oh God. Purify our hearts, O oh God. Worship team is going to lead us. Prayer partners, maybe you make your way up right now and just be available. I just sense there's a few people that want to come forward and pray. I'm just going to sing this last song, and then we're going to have a final benediction. Let's just make sure we've responded to God appropriately.